Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Glenn Royal. I'm the mayor of the city of Seabrook, and we're very honored to have each of you out here tonight to learn a little bit more about uh, the State Highway 146 expansion project. And we're joined as well by uh, representatives and members of the Houston District of TxDOT. Thank you both for very much for coming out and joining us and putting this on. Uh, I want to introduce uh, a few members of Seabrook, and then uh, TxDOT will be introducing their staff as well. But uh, currently, uh, I'm joined up here tonight with uh, our Mayor Pro Tim Gary Johnson. Uh, we also have our, our Assistant City Manager Sean Landis. City Manager Gail Cook, uh, Economic Development Director Paul Chavez. I have two council members out here for kind of lack of space, but I have Councilman Mike Giangrosso and Councilor Robert Lorente. There's also several past councilors out here as well. I saw Laura Davis who just came off. But again, we welcome you. I, I want to tell you, start out with a little presentation and a talk tonight before we turn this over. Uh, tonight, the city of Seabrook, along with the Texas Department of Transportation, would like to welcome you to this informational public meeting designed to inform and update you on the State Highway 146 project. The project has been in the works now for well over 15 years, and today more than for our city is feeling the need for this project to begin. In 2010, the average traffic count was 36,000 at NASA Parkway. By 2015, the projections are for over 50,000 uh, traffic count. And by year 2035, we're looking for 60,000 in traffic count at NASA Parkway. And so many of you here tonight are well of the project and its needs, and others of you may just be learning about it. Either way, it's our hope and desire to inform you and educate you on this much needed project. The State Highway 146 expansion project will encompass the entire corridor through the city of Seabrook, starting at Red Bluff and proceeding over the channel through Kima to FM 96. At this time, we have a potential construction date, start date of early 2017, if land acquisition stays on schedule. But I'm going to let TxDOT speak to that later. The city of Seabrook has not been idle in the preparation for the widening of 146 and has been working diligently, excuse my notes here, over the past five years and to to prepare for the potential impacts that we know will be involved in the construction process. With the anticipated loss of businesses and the effects from construction, the city has proactively set aside $800,000, which represents two years of estimated tax receipts for these businesses in what is known as a stabilization fund. These funds are designed to assist any substantial budget shortages that may be incurred during the project. Now that being said, you've seen a lot of activity around the city if you've driven around lately. You're seeing that there's a lot of effort and, and action today. Is that better? Sorry about that. You're seeing a lot of effort and action today to also increase revenue. As we get to this project, we're not financially uh, in, in straits. In addition, the city council has recently approved a rezoning request for a portion around Rep Store Lakeside area. And this was a difficult decision to make. But as a city leader, you realize you must analyze and make the call for the economic health of the city. So please rest assured that as massive as this project may appear, there's along the way to be prepared. The project has already gone through TxDOT's public hearing and environmental process, and it is an approved project with funds allotted for land acquisition and construction. And this evening, have TxDOT go over the scope of this project in more detail, discuss the status of the project, then move into the property acquisition or right-of-way acquisition process. While there may be some that would just assume the highway stay the same would like to debate the project, please understand that this is well beyond that point, and we're here to inform you and not debate. There will be a Q&A session. We're going to have a, four, a short Q&A of only about five questions because I think it's more importantly after you see the presentation tonight that we go out to the storyboards you have around us and you can ask the questions there so you can see it. Uh, I want to sincerely thank you for coming out tonight and participating and informing yourself about a monumental undertaking in our small city. There is no doubt that the end of the, at, at the end of this project we will emerge with a different looking Seabrook. And I want to reassure you that the city is committed to making sure that how this is carried out will be the safest and most advantageous for Seabrook. 
In closing, for those of you who may remember, we once said goodbye to an iconic drawbridge back in 1986, changing our landscape and the flow of traffic in Seabrook. Many of us at that time couldn't imagine what, uh, what that change would do to our area, and yet today, I don't think there's any of us that wouldn't say that that wasn't a good thing to do. So I believe that one day we're going to look back with time and with the rebuild of the city that we're in progress for and see that this is as good a project as we can do given the growth of our area. So at this time, I'm going to turn this over to Raquel Lewis, who's uh, with TxDOT, and she's going to introduce her staff and begin the program. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Royal and City of Seabrook for having us here tonight, and we want to thank you all for coming. Um, I want to start out and say uh, how much we appreciate you taking the time out of your schedules to come out this evening to hear information about the project. I'm going to tell you in advance, we don't have answers to all of your questions, but we do hope that when we get done this evening, you leave with a lot better confidence about where we are in the process of bringing this project forward, what our next steps are, and who to make contact with for your most specific personal questions about how you personally may be affected. So I'm going to ask you to have a little bit of patience as we go through the presentation. There's quite a bit of information we're going to cover. Um, you want to uh, hit? We got quite a bit of information we're going to cover for you this evening. I want to first introduce some of the people that are here with me and representing TxDOT. Uh, we have our Director of uh, Transportation Planning and Development, Mr. Bill Brudnick. We have staff from the Right-of-Way Division. We have Mr. Rudy Aguera and David Bryant, and staff from our Planning and Design sections, Patrick Gant and Ben Bishop. In the audience, we have some of our staff as well that are supporting the right-of-way operations as well as design and utility relocations. So we do have some people here that are going to be able to help address some of the questions when we disperse and actually move toward those uh, schematics and diagrams that we have. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick, and he's going to go over the first element, which is the history of the project, our current status, and the schematic design. All right, well, thank you, uh, Raquel, and uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Royal and Seabrook, for having us out here tonight. Um, let me start by giving a, a brief project history on this 146 project. This is a project that's been going on for quite a number of years. The planning stages for this project started in 1999 with the major investment study, or what we call the MIS. The MIS was a federally mandated feasibility study that looked at the entire 146 corridor from uh, basically Fairmont Parkway all the way down to Texas City. The initial phase of, of the uh, feasibility study is the project that's currently basically under construction, which is the, the freeway section from Fairmont Parkway all the way down to Red Bluff. The sec second section was this portion through Seabrook and Kima, uh, where we've looked at a, a number of different design alternatives through the years. It was in the major investment study that we looked at uh, options concerning freeways, uh, express lanes, wide-end arterials, and the like. TxDOT held numerous public meetings during the MIS phase and gathered comments. Uh, the MIS was trying to um, uh, look out into the future 20 or so years to um, prepare uh, a facility that would handle the future growth in the corridor and also improve uh, hurricane evacuation. 146 has a, a unique uh, mix of traffic that's currently on it. You have the, the heavy truck traffic that's going between the major ports up and down 146, but you also have the, the, the tourist traffic going to Seabrook and Kima, the, the Clear Lake area. That traffic is intermixing uh, throughout the day. And so by the end of the MIS process, the uh, proposed plan that we came up with was kind of a, a mix between uh, freeway style segments, arterial segments, and expressway segments. The MIS concluded uh, by basically a vote from the Houston Galveston Area Council called the HGAC, and that uh, occurred in 2003. After the, the feasibility study, the MIS was completed, 
We then moved on to the uh, schematic and environmental stages of the project. Schematic and environmental is where we develop the, uh, the full geometric design uh, schematic that you're seeing here on the, you know, the back walls and what have you. That uh, defined where the entrance and exit ramps were going to be, the uh, proposed uh, roadway grade separations and uh, vertical profiles and what have you. The environmental stage was also where we looked at all the different environmental constraints up and down the corridor, and TxDOT held another series of public meetings for the schematic and environmental stage, culminating in the final public hearing that took place in 2012, January of 2012. After the public hearing, TxDOT moved on and completed the environmental process and got what we call the finding of no significant impact uh, in 2013. That brings us to where we are today. Schematic and environmental are approved. That gives us uh, the authority to go out and begin the right-of-way process. So you can see there, that's, that's where we are today. I got a laser pointer here. So that's where we are at today, and we've, we're starting the right-of-way process, and we're starting the detailed design process. After the right-of-way acquisition is complete and the detailed designs are finished, that's when we can finally move on to construction. On this slide, I'm showing a, kind of a diagram of the approved schematic layout. We'll start here in Seabrook. As you're heading south from Red Bluff and heading towards Kima, uh, what we proposed in the original schematic was a, a grade separation or a bridge at Repstorf. We would have exit ramps southbound and entrance ramps northbound from Repstorf. As you proceed south along the 146 corridor, we would then have an exit ramp for NASA Road 1 and an entrance ramp northbound from NASA Road 1. In the original version of the schematic, after you cross that exit ramp, you get onto what we call the express lanes. The express lanes would be a, a parallel facility to the existing roadway that we know more or less today uh, through Seabrook and Kima. It'd be, so the express lanes would be a, a parallel bridge over Clear Creek and uh, on into the Kima area. So in the initial schematic, if you wanted to get to Kima, you would have had to exit it there. Moving on to the lower diagram here through Kima, you're seeing that express lane continue over the Clear Creek area. This portion of the express lanes would stay elevated over FM 2094 and over FM 518 before it came back into the middle of 146, just south of FM 518. Now, if you were heading north on 146, your exit to Seabrook would have been way back here. You would have had to gone through the light at FM 518 and FM 2094, go over the existing Kima Bridge before you could access NASA Road 1 and Seabrook. Here's a typical section of the proposed roadway through Seabrook. It's more or less a, a freeway style section where you'd have main lanes in the middle and frontage roads on either side. Through Seabrook, we're proposing that we need a, approximately 60 foot of right of way on the east side of 146 plus the entire 100 foot of the railroad corridor. Moving on to Kima, the Kima side, this is where we're proposing for the existing arterial that we know today to be widened to a six lane boulevard and in the railroad right of way, that's where the elevated express lanes would go in Kima. So the original schematic plan had some uh, issues with uh, accessibility. And we have one new proposal on the north end in Seabrook that extends frontage roads between uh, Repstorf and Red Bluff. So I'm pointing here, this would be a northbound frontage road between Repstorf and Red Bluff. Also, we're proposing a southbound frontage road from Red Bluff to Repstorf. This would allow for easier access in between those two roadways. We're also proposing to reverse the exit and entrance ramps in this section of the roadway. 
So if you want to get off at Rep Store, your exit would be here. And if you were wanting to get onto the main lanes of 146 from Red Bluff, your entrance ramp would be right there. The other project that we're considering adding to the schematic are two new exit ramps between Seabrook and Kima. Like I was explaining earlier, if you were uh, heading north on 146, south of 518, you would have had to have taken the arterial roadway all the way through Kima, go over the Kima Bridge, and then finally get into Seabrook. What this plan does is it provides a special northbound exit ramp, uh, basically just north of the uh, Clear Creek Bridge that would access the express lanes here, come and tie to the arterial roadway uh, just south of NASA. In addition, southbound, we're proposing a special exit for Kima. So as I was explaining earlier, uh, traffic that was coming from the north heading south on 146, uh, they could go over Repsdorf and NASA, continue on the express lanes, and then just north of the Clear Creek Bridge, we would provide a special ramp for Kima properties. So those are two projects that were currently in the uh, preliminary stages on, but we are working to add that to the project. Let me kind of transition into the, the uh, detailed plans, uh, where we're at with that. Currently, we're about 20 to 25 percent complete on the detailed plans for the project. We've separated the project into three smaller pieces, just basically for, for our purposes. But in the end, all three projects will be constructed at one time. The construction is targeted to begin in 2017, but it could start as early as the, the fall of 2016. All of this, though, is contingent on purchasing the UP Railroad Corridor. Um, currently, we have $189 million uh, penciled in for construction on this project. And we're anticipating at this point that it would take approximately three years to build. So with that, that's a, kind of a rundown on the project history, the schematic process, and uh, where we're at with the design. Now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Rudy Aguia to talk about the, the right-of-way purchasing. Okay, thank you, Patrick. Um, once again, welcome uh, uh, citizens of uh, Seabrook and visitors from uh, Kima. Yes, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of information on the uh, process, but we're going to start with the uh, with some of the project uh, stages uh, or the status of the project that we are in the right of way um, acquisition. Or and right now we're doing just the appraisal work, and um, we have. Uh, all the mapping done on this project from Red Bluff to um, Highway uh, 99. The mapping is completed. In, in, it, it does show on the on the schematics on the sides, um, and also the the environment, like I said earlier. Um, I have the uh, our program manager, David Bryan. He has the detailed information, uh, but we're gonna start with the with the status of the project first, and then he's gonna go back and and go ahead and show us the. Um, the stages of the process of right away. Good evening, everybody. I uh, hope you don't mind if I sit as uh, we go through the slide. But um, we're going to start off uh, this with the, uh, the, pro the proposed timeline. And I'd like to start off by saying that the success of this project hinges on our successful negotiations with Union Pacific. Union Pacific, uh, we invited them to be here tonight, but they weren't able to attend. But they did send us a statement, and I'd like to read that statement. Union Pacific has received a request from the Texas Department of Transportation to sell a portion of the railroad's right-of-way along the Seabrook Industrial Lead. Union Pacific has an extensive review process for these types of requests. The process considers all current and likely future use of the rail line, including a thorough review of current leases on the line. If you are a current lessee and have questions regarding Union Pacific's review process, please contact Rebecca Hoffman. Uh, we will have this information posted on the Seabrook uh, website later on, 
but for the time being, let's uh, go back to the timeline. We have uh, we've started the appraisals on the UP uh, railroad interest, and that includes the tenants' improvements on that property. We are hopeful that we can complete those re uh, appraisals uh, by the end of October, and and, and we can begin uh, negotiations with Union Pacific. Now, uh, Union Pacific is uh, unique in that the state cannot condemn the railroad's uh, property interest. So we really have to work closely with them, and uh, and we have found them to be uh, cooperative part, pro, uh, partners in other projects, and we uh, anticipate that we'll be able to uh, reach an agreement with them on this project as well. Once we get the appraisals done on the Union Pacific property, uh, we'll, we'll get a, an agreement in principle from them to sell. That's what we need, and uh, without that, we can't proceed. But once we get that agreement, we'll be able to start appraising the uh, property owners on the business side, on the east side. We'll begin that appraisal process, and hopefully we'll be able to make, start making offers to them uh, on the, in the second quarter of 2015. Uh, at the simultaneously, we will start the relocation process, and uh, and a few months later, we'll start the property clearing and the demolition. And we expect to do that throughout the year of 2016. Now, as far as the right of way process goes, our process begins with the mapping. And uh, Patrick, Patrick's group, he just went through the design uh, phase of this. And once the design is developed, our survey group will uh, do the right-of-way map and the parcel sketches. They're prepared, prepared by the licensed surveyors, and they prepare the legal descriptions uh, uh, along with the property descriptions. Uh, as they are mapping the, the project, they also identify uh, encroachments where it may be the case where property owners may think that they have owned property out to a certain uh, right-of-way line, but according to our maps, it may be either state property or UP property. So we get that all uh, delineated in the mapping process. Once uh, the mapping has been done, uh, we move to the appraisal process. TxDOT hires uh, independent contractors to appraise the property. They're not TxDOT employees. They will contact the property owners for their input for any specific information that the property owner may have and they want to bring to the attention of the appraisers and they want included in the appraisal. Sometimes the, a, a property owner may have their own appraisal and that would be useful to share with the appraiser if you have it. But as far as the appraiser goes, he is compelled to come up with what he considers the fair market value of that property. Once we get the fair market value, the acquisition process begins. An initial offer is based on that appraisal. The property owner can accept that offer and sign, the, and sign a deed or the property owner can decline the offer and make a counter offer. If TxDOT accepts the counter offer, the property owner can sign the deed. If TxDOT declines the offer, the owner can still sign a deed, but it has to be for the original initial offer. Otherwise, TxDOT will proceed with condemnation proceedings. In that uh, process, uh, special commissioners are uh, will set a hearing, and all the interested parties will be notified. That process takes about six months. As we are also acquiring the property, the relocation process is also going on at the same time. The preliminary contact with the property owner or the tenant is made during the appraisal stage, 
and a determination of eligibility is made. Now, it's very important for the tenants to know that in order to be eligible for these relocation benefits, you must be on the property, occupying the property, when the offer is made. So if you move in before an offer is made and expect to get relocation benefits, you won't get them. If someone else moves into that, that property, on the property, and occupies that building, they are the ones that will become eligible for the re relocation. The relocation agent will identify the benefits and the assistance that TxDOT has available, and they work closely with uh, the property owners, so they will make themselves readily available for any questions that you may have. There are relocation booklets back on this table that uh, will explain the process in depth, as well as right-of-way acquisition books, by the way. They're also back there on that book. I mean, on the table back there. The relocation agent will calculate the expenses related to the moving and or the reestablishment of the business. This includes, for example, letterhead, changing of the letterhead, business cards that you may need, or any advertising that uh, becomes necessary for you to reestablish yourself. In the event that we are not able to reach a settlement with the landowner or the tenant, the condemnation uh, process is initiated, and it is sometimes called or known as the special commissioner's hearing. The most common uh, reasons that uh, property owners proceed to uh, condemnation is number one, that they decline the offer or refuse to negotiate. We do have cases where we try to contact the owners and they won't even talk to us. In those cases, we just condemn the property. The, uh, another reason is for title curative issues. Sometimes we're not able to get a lien released. Even though the owner is willing to sell, with that pending lien, we cannot close the property. So we condemn the property, we join the lien holder, and uh, we handle it that way. Uh, there are cases where the tenant and the owner disagree. And the tenant and the owner have to be on the same page with uh, the, the process. Uh, in other words, if the tenant uh, is dissatisfied with how we value their improvements and they say, no, I don't want to uh, uh, sign a release, he can take the fee owner into condemnation and vice versa. Sometimes we condemn property because we're not able to locate the, uh, the fee owner. There's, this is going to be the case a lot on the railroad because uh, there, there's some very old title there. And the title has come in in the name of heirs from the early 1900s. So those heirs uh, are, are, we use a process called citation by publication in which we will publish the heirs' names in the, the newspaper, and it's up to the public to uh, take note and, and maybe identify an heir, or uh, if you see someone, a relative, or whoever that you think you might be able, might be related to, you can at least make a claim, and the title company will examine your claim, and we'll, uh, decide, you know, if we need to join you in the condemnation, but otherwise your citation by publication would be enough. And when it comes down to the deposit uh, in the registry of the court, you'll have that discussion with the judge and he'll decide if you're entitled to any of the proceeds from the condemnation. As we proceed to the condemnation hearing, Textile will order an updated appraisal. If you were dissatisfied with the uh, original value that the appraiser assigned to your parcel, uh, this is, there is a chance that on the update, it's possible that it maybe some more information has come in since the original offer, and the updated appraisal will take into consideration that information, and it may increase the value you will have an opportunity at that time to sign the deed rather than go forward to condemnation. But if not, if you're still not satisfied, then we will move forward with uh, filing a petition in the, red, in, in the court, with the court 
County Court. In that case, once the petition is filed, the county judge will appoint three special commissioners to hear both sides of the uh, opinion of value, and uh, they will uh, make a, uh, an award based on that evidence. TxDOT will be represented by the Office of the Attorney General, and the owner may, this owner or the tenant, may represent their own interest or obtain legal counsel, or you may decide you can uh, are satisfied with having a real estate appraiser or a land planner or anybody, uh, uh, a friend that's, that you feel more comfortable with representing you at that hearing, anyone can represent you as long as you give them permission. Uh, as the commissioners listen to both sides, they will award their opinion based on the evidence that uh, both sides uh, present. An award is deposited in the registry of the court, and the award means money that they have decided that this property is worth. They take that money and, and they take it to the, to the courthouse, and they, the check is physically deposited into the registry of the court. And it's up to the property owner at that point to get the money out. So uh, you'll be on your own to get that money out, whether you have a, 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 an attorney or however you decide to, uh, whoever it is that you have represent you, uh, there is a process to get it out. It, it does take some legal knowledge. Uh, there's a, a, a motion and an order that you need to get the money out of the court. And the judge will hold a hearing and they will, uh, before they give it to you, they will look at all the interested parties that are in that petition and uh, they will make sure that those parties that, uh, get their money. For instance, if we, it may be a lien holder that's owed some money on that property. The judge is not going to just give you all of it if that lien holder shows up and says, hey, that part, part of that is my money. So that's a whole proceeding in itself. TxDOT is basically out of that picture, and that becomes your responsibility to get it out. Uh, if once that, uh, once that is uh, done, uh, if you have, uh, you can get that money out and still proceed to the, through the legal process. If you think that, that uh, the commissioners didn't award enough money, you can file objections and take the process even further. And uh, the next step would be a mediation. And that is also an informal uh, meeting. It's held maybe in an office building, a library, but whatever. It's, uh, it's very informal and a mediator comes in and he also listens, listens to your side of the story and text that side of the story and would try again to uh, reach an agreement. And if you can't reach an agreement through the mediator, then a trial by jury is then ordered. And that is a six panel jury, six members uh, in the county will, be, will come in and listen to uh, the evidence presented and they will render a verdict. As, uh, as this whole process is going on, we have a property management department that starts the, uh, the property clearing process. The property owner or the tenant identifies which improvements they want to retain. Now, it's important to know that if you reach a settlement with the TxDOT by deed, you have the right to retain your improvements. The owner, the, either the owner of the, the, the tenant's improvements or the property owner. You can tell TxDOT, I want to keep those improvements. TxDOT charges a very minimal, maybe 1%, to sell them back to you. You'll be given a certain amount of days to get it off of the property or that property will revert to back to TxDOT because we give you an opportunity to take it off if you uh, just uh, procrastinate and it's time for us to begin the project, we will take it down. And all of that language is written in the agreement when you sign the deed. It gives uh, usually about 60 to 180 days at the most to you have to get that property off. Now, if you go to condemnation, 
the opportunity to retain the improvement is not there. That immediately becomes TxDOT property and we can dispose of it, or uh, the contractor at least can dispose, dispose of it at will. As we are just, uh, just uh, clearing the property, we do test the structure for uh, contaminants and hazardous materials. If, uh, if that property uh, is contaminated in hazardous materials, that it becomes an issue, there is a possibility that you will be charged to clean that property up before we dispose of it. And uh, we have uh, independent contractors to come in and they demolish the property. As we are also clearing the right of way, we have the utilities that need to be adjusted. There are uh, telephone lines, uh, electrical lines, gas lines, all those kind of things that are in the right of way. And TxDOT has uh, contracts with uh, the, the particular utility and we reimburse them for the expense of them moving that utility. The property owner sometimes has utilities of their own. And in that case, uh, this is something that you want to point out to the appraiser during the appraisal con process that you own certain utilities and that you will need to re relocate them. And in that case, he will include that in the appraisal, the money that you need to relocate those utilities. And that pretty much in, it concludes the acquisition process, and I'm going to turn it back over to Raquel. I think we have a um, simulation of the roadway that we're going to show. Uh, is Eric going to cue that up for us? So the city of Seabrook uh, consulted with um, some some staff and had some uh, consultant resources to help build a 3D diagram, is that correct? Of what the roadway would look like in its ultimate configuration. And so we want to allow you to see that. And then we'll turn it back over to the mayor and we'll take some questions and we'll go from there.
and you can see that technology is a pretty cool thing, but it's not perfect, but it is what it is. Uh, one of the things that we will do, and I did not introduce our communications director, Leanne Deerman. Uh, Leanne's responsible for most of the information you see put out by the city, including our website. We will post all this information that you've seen tonight, including the maps, on our website, which is www.seabrooktx.gov slash 146. And I encourage you to go there and, and become more educated. Uh, one of the things we're going to do here, and also I do want to acknowledge that the city of Seabrook is working diligently, as you can tell. We have been for a number of years. We have regular meetings with TxDOT about this project. We've been out in the public telling you what we can, and now we're at the informational stage. If there are more types of information that you need to know, please let us know, and we'll get out those meetings. We requested this tonight. We're, we're honored that you came here tonight to help us facilitate this. So now we're going to do this. We're going to have a few, uh, just a handful of questions and answers because I want us to be able to break to the boards out here so you can see as we have those discussions. So we have a mic here. I think uh, Mr. Paul Chavez is going to uh, lead that. Do we have anybody that has a question? Okay, it looks like on the map there's going to be a new intersection at the entrance to the point. Is that going to be a lighted intersection? I'm asking whoever knows the map. And the reason why I'm asking is because right now the entrances and exits from the point, um, you know, where the fish markets are, all of that is unattended by a light so that people can merge on as traffic assumes. This one looks like there's going to be an in a light at that intersection. And if that's the case, then all the traffic that usually stacks up on the bridge going to Kima, all that traffic has to get onto the artery roads. And they're all going to be backed up at that light if there's a light there. We haven't gotten far enough in design to um, determine the warrants for traffic signals at, at that particular location. Oh, sorry. We haven't gotten far enough along in the design to determine whether warrants will be needed at that specific intersection, and that'll have to be decided later in the, the design process. Okay. Hi. Oh, that's loud. Okay, my question to you is. Um, on the corridors at the beltways and major thoroughfares, you build retaining walls, big barriers between neighborhoods and all the noise. Are y'all going to do any of that? Say along, all along 146 from Lake Point Forest, Seabrook Island, Lake Cove, and everything else on the east side. Which yeah, is as a part of, of the environmental process, we studied the, the noise impacts for this proposed project. Uh, one of the concerns, though, that we're running into is the, the center point utility corridor is about 150 or so, 200 feet wide. Uh, so that uh, prohibits TxDOT from building any kind of noise wall on their property. That's on the west side. But on what the about the side. east side? And on the east side, that's uh, the area where most of the businesses are. But most of the businesses are going to be gone. So what are you going to do to penetrate or... Del uh, eliminate the penetration of the noise for the east side of the, of the corridor because well, that's uh, all still residential. You have all from Lake Meha all the way to Old Seabrook to uh, the bridge. The, the noise analysis did not uh, recommend any kind of uh, noise walls on the east side of 146. Okay, so y'all aren't thinking about that? We did a complete study for the whole corridor. My question is more directed at Seabrook. Where are all these businesses going to relocate? I noticed the rezoning in Lakeside, and some of us in Lake Cove are starting to be concerned. Uh, yes, this project, is, as you heard earlier, has been discussed for some 15 years. I remember going to uh, public hearings about this. I've gone to two, from Seabrook Intermediate Clear Lake Falls back before I was in office. Uh, part of the decision that we had to make with the relocation of these businesses, there's only 15% of Seabrook left to develop. It's a fact. There's nothing left. Seabrook's six square miles of land, 12 square miles of water. We got to the ship channel. So what we had to do was find a place for these businesses to relocate 
this property has been with that design with the res the circle that you go through at the lakeside has been intended so council made the decision to save the business base of seabrook by relocating this to this area so that's the driving factor 146 is a driving factor for us to develop that out two more questions then we want to go to the board uh, you have a lot of traffic flowing in from nasa one as it meets 146 i don't see a lot of change to that intersection below how are you going to alleviate that traffic I know you're going to pump some of it onto the flyover, but there's an immediate intersection in there where this stuff is going to be jammed up. Well, one of the, the major purposes for the express lane facility is to take the, the through truck traffic out of the mix. So truck traffic going down to Texas City or Bayport or, or the like, they would be on the express lane facility and the parallel arterial roadway would be for the local access. So if you're coming from NASA Road 1 and going towards Kima per se, uh, the intersection would benefit uh, by the through traffic not being in the signalized intersection anymore. In the northbound direction, um, you have the same situation going on. The through traffic is out of the mix. Um, but uh, we did have the concern with the original proposal where all the traffic from Kima uh, heading north towards Seabrook would have had to have gone over the Kima Bridge and just queue up at the NASA Road 1 intersection. So what we've done is we've proposed that uh, new exit ramp that I was showing earlier. That would at least allow some of the through traffic to uh, bypass uh, Kima, let's say, and be able to exit at that new uh, exit ramp and then get to NASA Road 1. One of the things I want to add to that, in the design as the cities work with TxDOT, we see these problems. I mean, it's, it was an issue where you knew that every uh, Mother's Day, Good Friday, all the big weekends when the chemo traffic and the fish markets were going, there would be a log jam on, on the expressway because you had to stop at Nassau Road 1. This new design change that's proposed was worked with the city of Kima that they came up with. Uh, and I tell you what, as far as engineering is concerned, it's a pretty impressive piece. My hat's off to the engineers that did this. The other thing that the city was able to work with is to understand that as we needed to save our business base, and by the way, our businesses want to stay in Seabrook. We have had numerous discussions. Our economic development director is out on a regular basis talking to these folks. They do want to stay in Seabrook. They're not looking to go. Where do you put them? So we had to find a place. But we were also able, on the part between Repsdorf and Red Bluff, Meyer, Repsdorf, Red Bluff, to get feeder lanes on both sides of that. Those weren't there, and I want to thank TxDOT for accommodating that. Okay, let's go to the last question, and we want to go to the boards. We have, uh, okay, I've got one over here. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about funding? How much is TxDOT paying? How much are the local municipalities paying? And how much has already been um, allocated, and how much is left, left to be uh, acquired? Well, right. Hello, my name is Bill Brudnick. Uh, as far as funding goes, right now we have $189 million set for construction. Uh, as far as the right of way goes, there's approximately, we got $30 million uh, allocated for that. The funding's been set, I think, what uh, we were looking at, I think, in years, uh, is it 17, 18, in 18? 17, 18, and 19. So, uh, Right now, that's where the estimates are, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Yes, sir. My main concern is uh, I've been going to all these meetings. I've been prop a uh, business uh, owner in Seabrook for over 40 something years, and every me every meeting we've ever come to. This is a three-leg process, the city of Seabrook, TxDOT, and Union Pacific. I understand on the, on the east side, it's cut and dry. You got procedures. And a thing been said about the west side of 146. Every time we come to a meeting here, 
which everybody on the west side has been there for years and paid leases for this land to put our, pro our businesses on their property. We never have a representative from Union Pacific. That's the other leg. I want to know why. Y'all say y'all ask them. We have never, I have never seen Union Pacific, and correct me if I'm wrong, at any of these meetings. And it leaves us sitting out here all the business owners has paid all this money for years and years, hung out. We don't know wh what we're going to have, who is going to do what for us. We paid taxes, county taxes, city taxes for 40 something years. And I don't hear any of you people talking about the people on the west, on the west side of 146. And I have never had one business development man ever call me and talk to me one time about relocation or anything else. My name's Robert Hill. I own Bay Area TV for 42 years. And I expect somebody to help the people on the west side. And if they, if anybody disagree with me, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Okay, sir, thank you very much. What did you well, Mr. Hill, I can say you already know what I'm gonna say because I was the person that replied to your email. So for the purpose of everyone else, I have to ensure that you know that number one, Union Pacific Railroad was indeed invited to participate in this meeting. Number two, we're here to try to offer information so that you understand where we are in the process and what the steps are. Number three, Union Pacific Railroad is an entity that we have to negotiate with as a property owner like we would any other property owner. So we are not in a position where we can assist, insist that they participate in a meeting like this. One of the reasons we really tried to focus on the steps and where we are today and how we got here is so that you could understand that prior to where we are now, we weren't able to make any real negotiations with you or UP. We had to get through the environmental clearance, we had to get approval, and we're now at that step. An offer will be made to UP, they will have to make a decision as a property owner how they will work with us. We're very hopeful that they will move forward, agree to sell, and then we can start working with the tenants and the other property interests that are specifically on the, east, on the west side. We started with UP and the west side specifically because everything is contingent upon that. We tried to make that clear tonight. If we haven't already done so, let me do so now. If they are not a willing participant in selling their property, this project doesn't move forward. So I understand your frustration. I wish I could offer you more to answer to that, but they are a property owner that we will have to negotiate with. Right now, they're negotiating in good faith. We're going to do everything in our power to keep it that way. We're going to try to keep communication open with them as well as those of you who will be impacted by the ultimate decisions that are made. But the reality is, is we're just now at that place where we can actually start making some things happen. And we hope that you work with us. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and break. I want to thank all of you for coming out, of course. I apologize for the discomfort. I'm one of those guys that melt above 72 degrees, so I apologize. But we're going to break. The representatives from the city and textile will be out around the boards and we'll be able to answer your questions. Thank you all very much. <laughs>